Greetings and welcome back. This will be the last lecture uh, on Congress. Uh, before I get started, I want to say thank you for your patience in working with me. Uh, this has been uh, very frightening going from face-to-face -face instruction, which uh, I've been doing in one form or another since January of 1983 to uh, a remote uh, concept and doing this work on Canvas has been quite an education for me. Uh, until uh, March, uh, I had never even opened a Canvas shell uh, and the thought that, uh, that I would be able to do something like this is kind of surprising. In my mind, this isn't nearly as good as being face-to-face. I've missed meeting my classes very, very much, um, but I've done the best I can trying to teach a course at my uh, my kitchen table. Um, but uh, I, I hope you've gotten something out of this. And uh, as you prepare for your final exam, uh, and if you have questions, I hope that you will email me or go to that Q&A cafe and ask me questions. Uh, if you think it might be something that is applicable to the group and then that way other people uh, can get that same question answered. So uh, enough of that. Uh, I don't want to get all all, all teary-eyed here. So uh, I, I wasn't planning on making this last video, but I don't think that I really covered the concepts of reapportionment and redistricting and, and, and gerrymandering very well. And so uh, I want to go over that uh, again. Uh, if you want to look at your textbook, the pages I'm going to be covering are approximately from pages 303 to about 306 or 307. I forgot the exact number, but certainly the core of this is pages 303 to 306. And there is a heading that says reapportionment and redistricting and you can start there. So uh, reapportionment is really just the technical name for redistricting. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, every 10 years there's a census. Uh, there is a question that will ask that. And Again, keep in mind I'm going to be putting in uh, about 75 or 80 questions into a test bank and the computer is going to randomly pick 50 of them for you. So when I say that it's a question I'm going to ask, that means it's going into the test bank. The computer may or may not choose it, and I'm not even sure how that works. Smarter people than me deal with that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that has happened over the last several decades is that population growth has been very significant in the western part of this country, uh, in the southern part of this country, uh, and has been very slow in northern states and in eastern states. So uh, there's an interesting uh, map. Uh, I believe it's on page 303. It could be 304. And that map shows uh, Texas gaining uh, four seats in 2010. It shows uh, the state of Florida picking up two. And of course, it also on that map shows both the states of New York and Ohio losing two. Keep in mind that reapportionment or redistricting, right? Uh, that reapportionment not only affects the House of Representatives, so obviously when Texas gained four House members, keep in mind what that also means is that they pick up four electoral votes, because keep in mind that every state has an electoral vote total that is equal to their total congressional representation. So when your book says that Texas gained four representatives, the book should also remind you that that means they picked up four electoral votes. When it says that New York and Ohio lost two representatives, that affects them in the House of Representatives, but it means that their power in electing the president also decreased. Now, I would make one distinction between redistricting and reapportionment. Reapportionment really uh, has to do with how many representatives you have. The redistricting is actually the redrawing of those boundaries. In, in every state, 
uh, except for states that obviously only have one representative. In that case, that representative represents the whole state. But after every census, people move within a state. Uh, I know for quite a while, the Central Valley of California, where we live, uh, was uh, picking up a whole lot of people. And along the coast, uh, it was growing much, much slower. And so we were seeing the redrawing of political boundaries and more and more congresspersons were representing districts uh, in Central California. So uh, the goal uh, of redistricting is how do you have roughly equal populations within each district? And of course, at the heart of that is that uh, there is a political agenda here. And both political parties do this. I know if you listen uh, to talk, uh, talk shows, uh, conservatives are going to say that liberals do this, and liberals are going to say that only conservatives do this. Both of them are only telling you half the story. They both do this. So uh, in a lot of states, you have state legislatures that redraw these boundaries every 10 years. And obviously, with computer modeling, uh, you can be much more precise in the redrawing of boundaries to maximize your political advantage. So put some stars or write this down in your notes somewhere, uh, of this concept of gerrymandering. Uh, gerrymandering is redrawing district boundaries for political advantage. Uh, it goes all the way back to the early 1800s. This has, in essence, been going on since the beginning of the Republic. And once again, uh, both sides do this. Uh, your book goes into a lot of uh, technical detail, talking about uh, cracking and packing as the two main ways of uh, pulling off an effective uh, gerrymander. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to know those differences. I'm not going to ask you a question about cracking and packing. Uh, but, but essentially, uh, what gerrymandering does, and I really like the quote from your book, uh, is that politicians, through gerrymandering, uh, actually are selecting voters rather than voters uh, electing politicians. And, and the significance uh, of gerrymandering, the redrawing of districts for political advantage, is that over time there has been a significant decline in the number of competitive districts. Uh, what we're seeing now are increasingly uh, more safe Republican districts, uh, more safe Democratic districts, uh, elections are more about preserving the status quo. Uh, there are relatively few competitive elections. When you consider there are 435 House members, you might have, I don't know, 50 or 60 uh, competitive races in a typical election, uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent uh, at most in a really volatile year, 20 percent. But I would say a safe guess is around 15% of the seats are pretty competitive. Uh, if you compare that to a country like Great Britain, uh, and you take a look at their House of Commons uh, elections, there are routinely uh, a couple hundred seats, uh, uh, maybe 30%, uh, maybe even 35% uh, in some elections that are competitive. And uh, one of the things that concerns me personally about the lack uh, of competitive seats uh, is that then uh, you you are beholden only uh, to the voters of, of one particular party. If you know that there's a lot uh, of of independence, if you uh, if you recognize that your seat uh, is, is really at risk then it's more likely that you're going to reach out and you're going to have a broader agenda. So uh, your book does mention uh, one concept at the end of this section that I want you to add to your notes. Uh, put the, the five stars next to it if you want. Uh, I forgot to include it uh, in the notes. And uh, uh, you'll notice that the uh, Congress notes are much shorter. They're 
far less detailed and that's because I did them uh, I, I did them last and I wanted to get these lectures in so uh, I'm, I'm adding some things to them as it hits me as I'm lecturing uh, and the concept that I want you to add is this notion of a majority minority district and a majority minority district is exactly uh, what its name implies this is where a district a a house district is specifically drawn to ensure that a racial minority makes up a majority of voters in that district and um the statistics, and I don't know, I, ha I haven't fact-checked this, it seems like it's a little low to me. I would think the uh, number would be a little higher than this, but I don't have any evidence of that, so uh, you don't need to know the numbers anyway, but your book points out that 15 uh, districts, uh, House districts, have a black representative with a, a majority of black constituents and nine Hispanic districts. Uh, our majority minority districts. So that is 24 districts uh, in the House of Representatives out of 435 that were drawn specifically based on racial demographics. And I know that there have been uh, some lawsuits uh, going to Congress about the legality uh, of these districts and uh, um, the, the, the courts uh have held different in different cases um there hasn't really been a consistency there so all i will say uh is, is that that is one form of gerrymandering but it is not the most significant the most significant uh is that gerrymandering is going to be done specifically to try to maximize the number of house members that your party gets in a state so you could theoretically have i don't know i'm going to make up a state let's call it randallville right i'm always using my own state as an example uh, and let's say that the representation in randallville is approximately 50 50. so uh, if elections were were fair and, and and the districts were drawn without political bias uh, you probably should have five democrats and five republicans or are six and four, it should be very, very close. However, using some of the devices that uh, your book talks about, cracking, packing, majority, minority districts, and others, uh, you might be able to set up a situation where instead of five Democrats and five Republicans, uh, instead the margin is something like eight and two because you have concentrated all of either the Democrats or Republicans, depending uh, on which party you belong to, uh, into a couple of districts. So they, they are very, very safe for that party. But you have packed them all in, or you have dispersed them so widely uh, that, uh, that they have a majority in uh, relatively few places. But uh, if you have a state in which uh, the distribution is fairly even. Uh, in my mind, the best way would be to pack people of one party, especially uh, if you have one large urban area into that area, uh, and then have a whole bunch of rural districts. So in theory, you could have, let's say in this example, uh, you have one or two uh, Democratic districts in the one or two urban areas in your state, uh, and, and then uh, you you have the rest of the uh, the state represented by smaller communities uh, in rural interest. And in theory, uh, even though the total uh, voter registration is relatively even, uh, you could have a situation where one party perhaps would have seven or eight of the representatives uh, instead uh, of only half. And that's the goal. The goal uh, is to get as many uh, representatives of your party as possible. Your book does a good job of saying how some states are trying to go uh, to neutral uh, commissions, uh, and California is one of those states. Uh, in fact, I made a recommendation for one of my former supervisors to serve on that uh, commission, but she was not selected. Uh, in some, it's been uh, uh, an interesting challenge. I thank you for taking this course and good luck on the final exam.